Hello and welcome to Black History and the Future of Data Science, a roundtable panel discussion with some black leaders in tech and philanthropy in honor of Black History Month. Hi everybody, my name is Nathaniel Taylor Leach. I'm the social impact manager here at Data Camp and I'm so excited to bring you this live stream where we're gonna to talk to some truly amazing people, uh, Data Camp Donates partners who are helping me at Data Camp uh, spread data literacy, across the United States and across the world to people who are in need. Uh, this, this program came out of the, uh, the pandemic, and we're happy to say that we've donated over 40,000 licenses through nonprofit organizations all over the world. But enough about that. I want to get to our guests, so let me bring them on right now. First up, I would like to introduce Nikisha Alcindor. She is the Managing Director at Riverside Management Group, a merchant bank and doctoral student at the Narendra Paul Lumba Department of Management at Brew College. She's a CUNY Graduate Center Fellow and the Provost Enhancement Fellow. She specializes in strategic management and research areas and mergers and acquisitions, examining the success rate of M&A transactions by applying artificial intelligence and machine learning to decision and risk analysis. She has extensive background in corporate finance, healthcare, and asset management. Uh, she's also spent time at Apex Partners, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Goldman Sachs, and Columbia University. She's advisory director to the PCA Retirements and Benefits, Inc., board member to the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone, and she holds a BA in chemistry from Emory University and an MBA in Columbia Business School as a Lean Cooperman Scholar. And Data Camp has partnered with Nikisha on her nonprofit, the STEM Educational Institute. SEI provides programming that gives underrepresented high school students the technological needs needed skills needed to enter today's workforce while building generational wealth. In partnership with several corporations, the program aims to serve as a diverse talent pipeline for organizations and build all that wealth. And Data Camp will provide free licenses and computers to their students for the summer. Welcome, Nikisha. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Really great to partner with you. Thank you so much. Awesome. You're very welcome. Next up, we have Sean Burroughs. Sean is the co-founder of Ingressive for Good, whose mission is to increase the earning power of tech talents in Africa by training 1 million youths and connecting 5,000 to jobs in the next five years. Since joining the Ingressive conglomerate in 2017, Ingressive has expanded from Nigeria into Kenya, Ghana, South Africa, and Rwanda. Sean leverages a decade of international operational experience and applies it to projects impacting youth-led initiatives, entrepreneurs, digital media platforms, and African tech ecosystems. He is committed to building socioeconomic infrastructure needed for a new African narrative by providing equal access to technology. Originally from the United States, Sean is a proud graduate of the Jackson State University uh, and CEO operations consulting firm Burroughs Enterprises. In partnership with Data Camp Donates, the Ingress for Good team has provided free data science education to uh, many thousands of individuals all over the African continent. Sean, thanks so much for being here. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me and be here with this amazing panel. It's so exciting. Awesome. And last but certainly not least, we have Roger Roman. Roger is an entrepreneur, angel investor, and marketing consultant for technology-driven startups. He's a two-time startup founder, and for the past five years, he served as the managing partner of Push Consulting and Marketing, a growth marketing and business developing consulting agency. Roger has been recognized by the New York Times, Venture Beat, Black Enterprise, LinkedIn, and others as an authority on digital marketing and startup growth. He has guided fledgling startups from launch to acquisition and helped establish corporations uh, Walt Disney, Universal Music Group, and Apple drive online visibility and growth. And Roger is the CEO and co-founder of AfroBlocks, the global pan-African freelance digital marketplace, building the tech infrastructure for Africa's future of work. AfroBlocks aims to create a diverse network of qualified and skilled African professionals to connect them with remote jobs from across the world. In partnership with DataCamp Donates, he's helped provide free and limited data science education to hundreds of freelancers in Africa and the U.S. Roger, joining us from Los Angeles. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me, Nathaniel. I'm happy to be here with, with all these brilliant people and looking forward to get this talk started. Cool. And I'm broadcasting live from the Empire State Building here in New York. Nikisha is also joining us from New York. And Sean, you are in Nigeria currently, correct? Yes, I am. Awesome. Well, let's get started. I actually want to get started with a question that we got from our audience. We put out a link to submit a question uh, on a form. And our first question is pretty straightforward from. It comes from Ayube in Nigeria and is, what is a career? in data science. Uh, why don't we just start there for those that may not be familiar. Nikisha, would you like to take that one? Oh, sure. Thank you so much for that question. So first, um, so when we look, think about data scientists, there's a difference between a data scientist and a data analyst. So a data scientist is usually someone who 
has earned a graduate degree, whether it be an MA or a doctorate degree, and they really focus on scientific methods. And they are the ones that really think about building processes or algorithms using different types of code. When you think about a data analyst, so first of all, most people, if you are in a job, especially a career that is revenue generating, you're most likely doing some sort of data analytics. And these are individuals that they're tasked with collecting data also, and also looking at data to then give some sort of insight to their organization. When you think about careers in data science, I would say that most companies have the option to be a data scientist. One of the least known things is when you think about organizations like Nordstrom, for example, a huge retailer, they are looking for data scientists. Why? Mainly because most of the information, all of the information that you put out there about yourself, either your buying habits, et cetera, those things need to be analyzed. And so what a data, someone would do in that area, they would come into a company like Nordstrom and they would analyze that data to subsequently give insight into Nordstrom. So how they can effectively target their audience and also serve their customers better. So thank you. That was a really great question. Yeah. So like, why, why would someone want a career in data science beyond just being interested in those topics? Mm -hmm. I think one of the most important things is as we look at the trends of career opportunities and the needs and the skills that that firms are looking for, you will make yourself a lot more open and attractive to careers and also the the salaries. Let's just look, just look at the fact that current salaries now, now for data science at entry level, you're gonna get about 60, 70,000. And that's just right out of college. But if you decide to go, you know, if you wanna get a PhD and you you focus on kind of data scientists and you're really in the weeds, you can get, you can make, quarter million or more in these fields. And so there's a huge payoff there. And the need is very, when we look at the data and the need that's actually pull, driving this, we see that there's a high, high demand for individuals in this field. And so I would think that that is a lot of motivation for individuals to think about getting involved in data science at some level. Yeah. And I'm sure Sean and Roger, later on, you can talk very specifically about that huge need and that massive void that 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 organizations like yours are attempting to fill with these roles. But for now, I actually want to take a step back and let's let's take a look at Black History Month, right, which is the reason why we're, we're here. And it is something that we should be celebrating and thinking about all year round. But I want to take a step back and and ask you all, what are some of the major contributions to computer science, to data science, to artificial intelligence by the black community that our audience may not be aware of? John, you want to take great that one? question? Yeah, great question. Um, one of the people that I love in this space is uh, W. E. B. Du Bois. Um, he's done a lot. I guess if you've ever studied anything Black History Month, um, I'm sure his name and face have popped up, um, including uh, you know working with the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics and even starting the NAACP. But one thing that really stuck out to me was uh, with the uh, publication that he had at the time, the Philadelphia Negro. This was actually one of the earliest examples of statistical analysis in the field of sociology. So uh, we have, it's not just the current history that we're trying to break into, but in the very beginning of this space, we've also had roles that we've played. Excellent, yeah. Um, and any others that from, so, so we have a, a, a strong statistical foundation from W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, Nikisha, can yeah. you talk to us about Dr. Maria M. Daly? Yeah, so Dr. Daly, she was the first African-American in the United States to earn a PhD in chemistry. So I have to love her, right? Because I was a chemistry major at Emory and it was pretty lonely. So to see someone that looked like me earn their degree was is just so so amazing and not only did she earn this degree but she really contributed to the area of science when you look at the the correlation between um protein synthesis and the connection between cholesterol and hypertension she really led that way to really thinking about how what causes heart disease and it's a huge contribution to the, the pharmaceutical industry and to chemistry so i i love her and I would also add, you know, many of you may or may not know about hidden figures. Those women were amazing. 
And so you have three women there. You have Katherine Johnson, you have Dorothy Vaughn, and you have Mary Jackson. And in total, these women pretty much helped code the the first spaceship to go up in, to, in, into space. And not only that, they were called the, the human computer. And so while we have like little small processors that we fit into our laptop and even into our phones, they really were there at the forefront using punch cards. And so really amazing women love the movie. And I always think of them when I'm thinking about them. Yeah, that's an incredibly inspiring movie. And um, I learned so much from it. And yeah, we forget that the word computer back in the day was most of the time referring to women, honestly, who are actually yes. doing the computing, right? And how far that we've come. But yeah, I encourage absolutely everyone on this call, if you haven't seen the movie Hidden Figures, please do. Roger, who are some of your heroes in the space? Um, so I'll, I'll start with Carter G. Woodson, the, the, the father of Black History Month, the, the founder of Negro History Week, um, a true historian. You know, he relied a lot on data, um, partnering with, with like Arturo Schumberg in New York, who um, had the largest, uh, still the largest collection of, uh, of, of information and books on Black people across the globe. So this was, you know, 1930s. This was pre-computers where people were actually using this data science. And, you know, I know Sean mentioned W.E.B. Du Bois, who... I mean, most consider him the father of urban sociology. So data, you know, in, in terms of, of black people here in the United States and, and across the globe has always been something that we focused on um, to kind of relieve some of these societal ills that we've been faced with. Um, so, yeah, those are my heroes long before the computer age. These guys were, you know, were digging through the numbers and digging through the books and actually creating um, a data set that a lot of times we still use today um, to, for, for, for our people. Let's talk a little bit about Carter G. Woodson and the Black and, and, and Black History Month, right? Like, what is, what was, what spurred on? Why why did he see a need to to make this a reality? And why do you think it's um, over the years grown and struck a chord with with so many Americans and and across the world? Uh, and and you know, you see it as anyone who turns on the TV or looks at an ad will notice that this is something that that a lot of companies, organizations, governments are really leaning into in a in a great way. And so. Yeah, any insight into why Carter decided yeah. to create this thing? Yeah, I can jump I can jump on that. So Black History Month originally started as Negro History Week. Um Carter G. Woodson was a historian. Um, you know, he was a, a independent historian. He 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 worked for a few universities, but for the most part he was independent in his studies. Um and he started ne Negro History Week in February to celebrate or to honor Abraham Lincoln's birthday and uh, Frederick Douglass's birthday. So at first it was just one week celebration and it was really to celebrate the African in history who had largely been displaced from history. Um, you know, not, not necessarily, you know, rest on our laurels, but, you know, recognize and understand, you know, the place that black people across this globe have, have had in, you know, elevating and, and advancing humankind, right? Like there's a lot that was left out at that time. And thankfully today we, we have a lot of that information and there's still more to find, but, that was the original impetus uh, or the original idea behind Black or Negro History Week. Later in the 70s, you know, spurred by the Black Power Movement and a bunch of people, like thousands of people across the country um, got together to really fight to make it a month. Um, and they did. And, you know, there was a fight with a lot of states that didn't want to recognize it and things like that. And eventually we got to where we are today, where it's Black History Month. And it's becoming, it's not there yet, but it's becoming more of a Pan-African celebration. We have people across the globe, continental Africans, um, you know, starting to recognize or, or come up with, with different celebrations of, 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 of their excellence themselves. Um, but it's, it's not quite there yet. It's, it's still, you know, mostly a, a Black American celebration or a Black American uh, mm -hmm. honor. Um, mm -hmm. But we're getting there. We're getting there. We think, uh, you know, long term, it, it's, it's an opportunity for everyone to celebrate Black people throughout history. Thank you for that. And, and for actually that. really motivate, to really motivate the future as well. Like, it's not a thing where, you know, hey, we were once great, you know, and, and let's just celebrate that. It's like, hey, these things have been accomplished by Black people through mm -hmm. history, and there's more to be accomplished. You know, you have the power in you as a Black person to do those things as well. Mm -hmm. So let, let's, was, let's, let's fast forward to today then. What are some of the contributions that the Black community is, is really bringing to the forefront of data science and artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll I mean, take one, that. Go okay, ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Nikisha. Nikisha, why don't you take this one first? 
<laughs> no worries, no worries. I get so excited. So one of I have two heroes. Um, the first one I'll talk about is Timney Gabriel. And so Timney Gabriel, you may or may not have heard of her. She was a data science and expert at Google who was actually fired because of the findings that she found out in regards to their algorithms and how the, the potential biases that were within their algorithms. And she's also at the forefront of of AI research and a specific one specifically when it comes to ethics and and her her determination to make sure that it was it is known that that algorithms can have biases in them is so powerful and her work is so important and she continues to do this work despite any backlash she might have received um, the the second woman, a black woman, I would definitely bring up is a woman named Joy Balamwini, and Joy is amazing. So Joy was a PhD student, and she realized she did facial recognition. So she realized as she was doing these experience experiments with facial recognition that the machine didn't recognize her face, and it was because the machine. For those of you who may or may not know, the way algorithms and AI works is that there's uh, a field of study called machine learning where you're basically training an algorithm to kind of recognize different things. And as she went through her study, she realized, wait a second, this algorithm has not been changed, trained to look at the black community and the diaspora and our different shapes and colors. And so that led her in a huge, you know, huge area of really thinking about facial recognition and bringing it to the forefront. I mean, most of you may or may not be surprised to know that there is, there isn't a standard of privacy when it comes to facial recognition in the United States. I think there are three states who have some sort of guidelines around privacy and there's a huge implication to that, right? You may or may not, and you could do a simple experiment. If you, if you have your web camera open on your, your laptop, and then you go to Amazon, you might notice that Amazon has picked out a shirt for you that is now in your, your feed. And you're like, wow, that shirt looks like a shirt that I was wearing. How did they know that? And so there are things that are happening that we have no control of. And so Joy really brought that to the forefront and she's just an amazing individual. So those are the my heroes today. I almost wanted to clap for that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'll just jump in. Um, so I think you mentioned one of the ones I was really excited about uh, with Ms. Gebru. Um, but one of the ones, I guess these are the people that we know. These are the very, very visible people. And hopefully today I'll use this platform to uh, bring some visibility to a person that's more so behind the scenes, but that's doing amazing work. Um, so one of my heroes in this space is Devaris Brown. He's the co-founder of Maroxa. And basically that's a company that builds enterprise grade uh, data pipelines in real time. Um, but he's a product manager and an engineer specializing in helping startups and large companies, um, you know, kind of reach their data goals. Um, what caught my attention though, was a lot of the work that he was doing behind the scenes to build out training programs. And not only was he building out these training programs that served as a pipeline to some of these bigger companies, um, but he was also making sure that he did uh, focus in on and bring in disenfranchised communities and black people into this space. Um, I know that we'll get to that part uh, later on in the conversation, but um, again, kind of taking certain responsibilities on his shoulder and again, creating global level standard training, um, building these relationships, building these networks and plugging people in. Um, and he did not have to do that. Um, he was the co-founder again of Maroxa that sold for over a billion dollars. Uh, he's worked for Zendesk, ClickPush, Intel, Cisco, so many other big, big companies where we know that he was making a lot of money. Um, but again, one of these, again, it's a later on question, but he's one of those people to me that took time out of his crazy schedule and ensure that he took the, uh, he took that time to give back to uh, black people in the community. That's amazing. I didn't, I did not know about him. Um, moving on. I want to get to some question, some more questions from our audience. Um, I want to direct this, this next one over to you, Roger. Um, this comes from Akil in New, from New York city. What more can be done to make the data science field more inclusive of black and brown working class people? 
Mm, that's that's a great question, Akil. Um, I, I think, you know, a lot of times the burden, I think we put the burden on the people who are, you know, looking to to, to break in, so to speak, into these spaces. Um, and I think I, I, I just think that's kind of unfair. I think the burden is really on the, you know, the corporations and the leaders in these corporations to actually, um, you know, recognize their biases, you know, they recognize their pipelines, you know, if they're recruiting from the same schools all the time, or they're recruiting from the same geography, and they're not really opening their eyes to the other people. Even though there's a, there's a, there's a dearth of, you know, there's a lack of, 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 of black people in the data space. Um, there are more people getting into it every day. And, and, you know, it's not, they're out there, right? Like they, they, it's not zero people, you know, who are studying these things, the people who are studying these things, um, you know, data science and, and, and these spaces are out there. It's, it's really on the companies and the corporations to find the people. And then I think for, you know, just for an individual person who wants to get into data science, take advantage of the resources, right? Like there are tons of resources out there now um, over the last few years. I mean, data camps, you know, data camp donates is one where, you know, there's opportunities to actually learn these skills and learn these things um, for little to no money. Most times, you know, you can get stuff done for free. You know, we're in the information age, right? So anything you want to learn, it's out there for you to learn. Um, I think the individual just has to do that and make sure they're sharp on their skills. But the burden really falls on, you know, the the employers and the people who are hiring and um, to really kind of recognize that they have some biases, um, confront those biases and then do something about it. Right. Like, you know, talk to people like Nikisha, talk to people like Sean. Um, and I, I think and, and I'll say this, I'll add this. I think what Nathaniel and, and Data Camp Donates has done over the past few years is is key. Right. Like actually going out and finding the people that are doing the work and connecting with those people and not trying to build, you know, build everything from the ground up, but actually connecting with the people that are out there now. Yeah, thanks for that, Roger. And I, I completely agree. A lot of the onus is on companies to address their bias, as you said. And let's be real, you know, um, oftentimes we're talking about an unconscious bias, right? We're talking about blind spots and yeah. it's the same, it, in, a, in this kind of scary literal sense, the same, to apply the same sort of thing to it. Nikisha's example about, uh, about uh, machine learning and recognizing black faces, right? If black, if, 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 if the black community is not at the table creating these algorithms, they're not going to be represented and these algorithms are just not going to literally recognize them, right? It's going to be a literal blind spot. Um, so that's what we're talking about here. It's, 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 it's doing a full on 360 look at all the processes and saying, okay, but where are we just, what, what areas are we just ignoring? And that not, may be through no fault of the organization on its own, it's just, that's the way things have been 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 being done for a while now. Um, I want a, a few a few statistics I want to bring to everyone's attention. So another way that we can get more people from working class backgrounds into this is obviously through education. And currently there are two, over two thousand STEM bills introduced in the House of Representatives in just in twenty twenty one to increase education. And there's a lot of state legislatures that are specifically passing. Uh, laws in effect to uh, incorporate data science throughout all levels of the curriculum, all, all grade levels, but also not just math and science, incorporating data science ideas into arts, into English. I know the CS for All campaign here in the New York City Department of Education is doing that. So that's exciting. Obviously, we need governments and educate and public schools to really start investing in this and first making sure that computer science is available uh, to all students. Right now, it's in less than half of US high schools, for example, or just over half, um, but that needs to be 100%. And only then can we even start drilling down into specific data science education. But also women make up less than right. one third of all employees in the tech sector and just 11% of data scientists and they're paid less on average. And women in color represent less than 3% of those in technology and fields. Um, about 3% of data scientists identify themselves as black. Only 5% of those in software development and system jobs are African-American and just 5% are Hispanic or Latino. And there are 20% fewer LGBT individuals in government and STEM related jobs than should be expected. And a lot of the STEM workforce, research shows that a lot of the STEM workforce is closeted. Uh, a question from Dia in Philadelphia got me thinking about these things. And I wanna to throw it to you, Nikisha and Sean, if you wanna follow up. What are, you, are the top three tangible steps firms can take to have true diversity on their teams and not just race? Um, so I don't know if I have all three, but I know some of the uh, steps that have true diversity, I think we've already touched on one of them, is just, just adjusting where you look for your talent. 
Um, I was just looking up, there's the HBCU data consortium where you have uh, no less than six different HBCUs that are working together to create programs and to create education and to push black people into the data science space. And just for um, audience, the HBCU is you, a historically uh, black uh, university. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think I think again, it's it's changing the practice of um, of of where they're looking and finding their talent. Um, I think also uh, I know there are several companies that have diversity programs and different things like that. I think there's also a a push that can be done to make it more visible. I know some of these companies are um, historically. The way they are, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying not to be to, to insult them, but just with these new, with these new platforms, you know, there's just so many different ways that you can make yourself visible. If we're looking at, um, if, if you were to look at, let's say, a year and a half ago, if you would have looked at TikTok and said that that you're putting content and information there, I would have assumed that you were a, a 15 year old just by data. Um, you would be a 15 year old girl. But now that we've pro kind of progressed in different things like that, we're looking now and seeing these different platforms and seeing different ways we can be visible and communicate with our different uh, populations. So if some of these major companies would, you know, leverage those a little bit more to gain visibility, I think that would also help. Yeah, and I completely agree with Sean. I think a lot of times firms overthink this, where it's like, oh, we need to like gather all these people and do all these things, and it's like, well, just let's think about just K through 12 education. How much time does it take for you to contact? I mean, we work with local Boys and Girls Club. Shout out to the Madison Square Boys and Girls Club. And when we just go to them and we do a presentation about what you do, there's nothing more effective than going to a diverse population and just telling them what you do. Mm. We see this at the collegiate level as well, at, you know, Columbia at Baruch. Just go in and tell them exactly what it is that you do, because a lot of times firms get caught in their, their own space and they think everyone knows who they are. And candidly, no, they don't. And so it's, it's up to you to kind of go out there and give people and arm people with information and then take it a next step. If you have individuals who are interested, like Bureau Veritas, our executive sponsor, they came in, they did a wonderful info session for students to learn about their company. And then students were able to apply to our one week program that Bureau Veritas sponsored and learn more about the firm. So think mm -hmm. about partnering with SEI, think about partnering with you know, other organizations that can help you do this work because you know, the excuse of we don't know where diverse people are is just that's just no longer works, right? Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why I started yeah. the STEM Educational Institute because I don't buy, buy it. And I was kind of sick of uh, hearing other corporations com keep repeating that line. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I will fall on that. Thank you so much. Yeah. And yeah. And I'll just, you, add, if I can, yeah, go Nathaniel, for it, I'll just add to that to Lisa's point, you know. Building a DEI wing on your company, like that's all great symbolically, but when you when you put a person in that position and then you don't really empower them out and do the work and do it, you know, it's 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 useless, right? So instead of you know taking those resources to create this symbolic position of, of DEI or whatever, go to the ground, go to people, mm -hmm. like I said before, like Nikisha, like Sean. Mm -hmm. People are actually doing this work because there, there are people out here who are doing this work every single day. And it won't be hard at all to find their talent. Sean mentioned the HBCU uh, consortium. Like that's, you know, my alma mater, Howard is a part of that. There's a lot of talented people out here. They're just not getting the opportunity. So it, there's really no more use, you know, like Nikisha was saying. There's, the excuse is not there anymore that we can't find these people because they're there and there are people who are sourcing and, 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 and putting these people, you know, in a pipeline to, to, to be uh, effective and, and to be employees or even founders for, for um, data companies. Roger, you bring up such a really good point, and I actually want to take this as an opportunity to talk about just the um, the potential to find this diverse talent already working for your company, just not necessarily in the position that maybe they're they're best fit for. Let's go back to that that uh, that example of Nordstrom's, for example, right? If if Nordstrom's needs um, needs to up their data data team uh, vastly, rather than putting out uh, job postings for very expensive roles. Uh, why not look at your top sellers on the floor selling the product? Mm. Who knows the product well? Mm. Who who has who seems to have an inclination towards numbers? And 
instead taking the opportunity to train that person to become a data scientist, empower them, make them feel respected, make them feel valued as a person, as a member of the team with a lot more to offer than just a small skill set. And that's where you know companies like Data Camp can come in, which can help any organization train and upskill anyone on their team from going mm-hmm. from a complete novice with little to no knowledge about data to being an expert in technologies like R, Python, SQL, Tableau. So I think that's a really, really important thing that it's not just about trying to find, it's not just about putting out a million job postings. It's also about just looking, taking stock of what you have already and seeing how can we, um, how can we raise uh, the people that we already have, and that's going to create a better feedback loop in general. Um, yeah, and moving. understanding that you got to give people a shot. Um, you yeah. got to, you got to give. Uh, I'm sorry to, to jump in, but you got to, you know, there's this this idea that you know you want to hire this senior person, and that's not always, you know, if 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 black people in general can't get jobs in data science, how are they going to get experience, right? Like that's right. it just doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? So. Sorry, yeah. I get I get passionate about it. Nathaniel. No, look, I get it. Like yeah. I got before I was social impact manager at this company, I got started out as the office manager, you know, and then being able to have have someone like our CEO see my growth and see what I'm interested in and know that oh, I also have a background in nonprofits, and now I'm able to work on this. Just like that created such a sense of loyalty and passion for what I'm doing, you know, that I think if someone just got hired above to to take care of this, uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't have that engender that same level of of brand loyalty and belief in what we're doing. So I, I definitely encourage companies to look at their own pools of talent and think creatively and give, again, as you said, just give people a shot. Hey, it might not work, but you, you don't know until you know, right? Yeah, um, and I and I and I have to add there, you know, one of the misnomers is that the black community that we're not data science ready. I mean, that if you've ever had a student or a teenager, ask them. A teenager will put up an Instagram page and sell a product overnight. They can do that so quickly. Their ability to use plugins and get something up and running is amazing. And it's when you, and so I challenge any executive you know out there to talk to a junior employee and ask them just about social media or anything because they're they are so ready and equipped to take on these new challenges and do the science. So. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Most definitely. Um, okay, moving on. Um, what are some of the top areas that data science can focus on for uh, black people and people of color? So I guess we're talking about topics of study, new technologies. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I would say when it when it comes to kind of just what are some top areas for data science? I think that the one of the biggest things that we could start looking at is really this artificial intelligence and this machine sharp learning arena, yeah. right? And the reason why that's so important is because we need diverse talent building these algorithms. There's a theory that's called bounded rationality. Martin Simon talks about it, and later on, um, Don Hamrick and Phyllis Mason write about it. And basically what it says is that your cognition plus your values help you make strategic decisions, right? So when you think about a data scientist and someone who's creating an algorithm, they're using their, co- they're coming from their cognitive base as well as their values to create an algorithm that's going to make predictive measures, right? And so as a firm, when you're thinking about, you know, the, the research shows this, if you're going to be successful as a firm and improve your performance, you need innovation. So having a diverse pipeline is going to help yes. you be more innovative, right? Because these algorithms, they're impacting us, you know, for those of you who don't know, when you apply to a job, it's not a woman in HR checking off the boxes. No, it's a machine that's been trained to look at your resume, to look at your cover letter and mm-hmm. give an HR professional a sentiment. Is this person a match, et cetera, when it comes to credit scoring and wealth? One of the things we work at, work with at um, the STEM Educational Institute, we teach students about wealth management. Why? When you use your credit card at certain stores or you go a certain place, it affects your credit cards. And that those effects are built through an algorithm, right? And so all of these things are super important to the Black community. And it's one of the reasons why we really need to be involved in data science and data analytics. 
Yeah. Sean, any other, really yeah, any other areas that you think that, uh, how, how else can data science research and study uh, uh, impact the black community positively, Sean? Um, just to add on to what she was saying, um, I think she's touched on some of the different learning paths that you can take and also some of the spaces it exists in. Um, but I think you have to just start with the realization that the there are stereotypes, prejudice, uh, you mentioned earlier, Nathaniel, unconscious bias that are already sneaking in to algorithms and AI. Um, I think this can only be addressed if we start looking at uh, Black representation within this space. Um, when, when it comes to us having the conversation around how do we get more Black people and what should we do about uh, this thing, I think we have to start with the understanding that whether you like it or not, you're already in data science. Um, mm. Either A, you are learning <laughs> some way to, to earn a living or do something, or B, you are somebody else's data. Um, and again, if we are not being represented, then the data that we are participating in or the data that we are a part of, it doesn't benefit us. So we need to get into that space so we can make sure that these things start benefiting us. Um, if we're looking at what has happened historically, um, I know one comment that I heard, I can't remember where, but they're saying history is literally being rewritten by algorithms. So now when you start looking at, um, you may look at your bank account, you may look at how much you're spending and think like, oh, everything's fine. I'm doing pretty, pretty good. I can pay my rent. I can buy things if I want. But let's talk about your credit score, your credit reporting and how where you live and how how uh, mortgages all these different things. Yeah, exactly. Mortgages. Um, if we even go back uh, to take a step out of that, if we look at um, facial recognition and different things like that, where there was a guy who went to jail basically because facial recognition just didn't get it right. So for me, um, spaces and areas that we should pay attention to. Um, again, we already talked about the credit space. We definitely need to uh, take a look at how, we, how are we going to participate in the healthcare space or health data in general, mm. especially when you look at mm these throwback um, things that we were given where somehow black people were assumed to be able to take more pain uh, than other people. So then that impacted how we were given medicine and different things like mm -hmm. that. They're collecting data in these spaces and having a better understanding. So again, um, we need to be able to step up and say our part to ensure that again, the data that is being collected and used benefits us. Yeah, let's just speak frankly yeah. here. The COVID-19 yeah. hit the, the black community harder than most communities. Perfect. Why is that? The, 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 the only answer we're going to find is in the data. And we're, yeah. we're not going to get those answers unless we have uh, black individuals actually probing the data. That's the only way we're going to get to the truth of the matter on that. Mm -hmm. And 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 I, yeah, I think, there's so, think so to, many. Yeah, go ahead, Roger. Roger. To, 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 to add, uh, you know, data, it seems like it's this obscured subject, right? That only these really smart people who are good with numbers dig into. But I, I think you know, to Nikisha and Sean's point, like this is a part of our everyday practical life at this point, right? Like, right. you know, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through the the, the repeat of, of of the ways it affects, but it, it much affects every component of your life, even you know, crossing the street, right? If 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 the the cameras on the the auto automatic driving cars or the self driving cars can't see you because you have a darker skin tone, you know, you can be hit by a car, you know, and it, it, it's, 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 it's not funny. That's what it boils down. Funny, but, yeah. It's not funny, but it's true, you know. And 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 someone built that 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 algorithm or built that you know that data set that that you know they let they they brought their unconscious bias into it. So um, it's it's a part of our practical everyday life. I think you know in in terms of future careers, there are a ton of careers, there are a ton of opportunities. I would I would push all young people, college students, even like you know computer science grads, recent grads, to really look into the space and find a niche, um, a place where you can actually fit in. And, and, you know, make some real effective change, because if we don't, um, you know, technology can be used to, to help us out a lot and, and to, to improve our situation. And it can also be used to oppress us even more. You know, mm -hmm. we, want, we don't want to let that happen. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's very important. <laughs> And I was just going to add too, just to just to bring the conversation to inclusive outside of the black community, that this is affecting everyone. I think that you know, you ever wonder, you ever think that your iPhone is listening to you, and 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 it is. And how is it listening to you? You know, researchers researchers are showing that your voice has a wavelength. Right? So technically, they're not listening to you. They're just taking the the speed at which your voice is speaking and using AI to translate what you've just said. 
Because sometimes you're like, wait, what, how did they know I was looking for this? Did you just tell someone these? So this is really important. And I think AI, machine learning, coding helps people empower their choices and know that they should have more command over their privacy in general. So, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm also reminded of the fact that um, it's just so important that the beautiful thing about data for me, as, as, as someone who's not a technically, I'm not a data scientist by any, by any measure, the beauty about data is that it's about everything, right? So you could take, and, and because the technology exists that anyone can get into it and start figuring this stuff out, you can take whatever your passion in life is and make a career out of it by studying the data about it, right? So if you're, if you're obsessed with sports, right, they're going to be, tell you what, NFL teams, MLB teams, they're hiring data scientists so they can figure out well, how they're going to draft their next round, right? If you're, if you're invested in video games, guess what? You know, EA is tracking every single movement that someone does in a video game, and Activision is tracking every, you know, how you get those headshots on Call of Duty, and they're they're analyzing all of that data so that the, their next game could be even more popular. So if that's what your passion is, data is there for you. It really, no matter what your passion is, um, you can apply your into intellect to analyzing the data from those fields, create a, a positive change in that field, and uh, get a great career doing it. So I, I want to make sure that everyone comes away from this meeting with that, that data is about everything, and you can you know, over the course of a career, you can hone in on the exact right company, the exact right field where your data skills can have the biggest impact for your community. Nathaniel, I really love what you just said, because one yeah. of the things that data and paying attention to these technologies also, it gives you a heads up as to whether or not you're still going to be needed by your current company. There's a mm -hmm. very great article that came out by CB Insights that said the title was The Investment Bank is Dead. And what it was talking about is the fact that blockchain, all of these are these these technologies are literally replacing what humans used to be. And so if for bare minimum, you have some knowledge so that you can be command so that when the day comes and your boss is like, well, we know we no longer need a trader to settle these trades because we have blockchain. You can then say, hey, I know something about that and put yourself in a position of power versus displacement. And so it's so important to keep keep track of these things as well. Awesome. It's great. Um, moving on now. Yeah. Uh, moving on. So what are some opportunities that already exist for data science education in black communities and how do we increase those opportunities? Um, I could start really quickly that data camp for classrooms is available to all teachers worldwide, available to all college university professors, as well as high school teachers in the U S and the UK for free. So any teacher can apply for that and get six months of free access to almost all of our courses, as well as our new products like Workspace. Um, and they can invite an unlimited amount of students. And after six months, they can just reapply. So I want to put a, a big message out to all of our all of our teachers um, uh, out there that you can be the step one into impacting a young person's life and getting them invested and interested in data science. So um, and we're, we're planning on bringing those opportunities to more secondary school teachers all around the world. Um, Sean, any other opportunities that you know of that exist where people can get involved? Definitely, definitely. Um, one of the things, uh, especially my company does, Ingressive for Good, we're passionate about community. I always say that when it comes to learning, one of the best places to do so is surrounding yourself by people who are passionate about the same thing that you're passionate about. Um, why that's relevant now is that, um, as Roger mentioned before, we now live in the age of information. Um, you know, uh, during COVID, when Harvard decided that we're going to charge you the same price, but we're going to put all of our courses online. There's so much, there's just, uh, there's so much information online, uh, basically, where you're able to go there and, and cherry pick this and take this. And once you put yourself inside of communities, you're able to understand and ask questions. Um, again, um, there are just so many different ways it, when you're just looking online and pulling up information. Now, everything that you pull online is not true. But again, um, when you're able to look at certain communities that have come about, um, there are so, so many of them. I can't uh, uh, think of all of them, but like there are some like Data for Black Lives, uh, Mechanism Designed for Social Good, Black and Data. 
the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab. You have all of these people who have put a lot of time, energy, and effort. And let me not even forget Data Camp. That's just kind of creme de la creme. But like, you have people that are just really, really focused on aggregating all of these resources. Um, and again, building community around learning and supporting different people. Um, so there, there's that part. There's, um, you know, for all of our uh, young people, our young parents, our people with children, let's just say, um, education starts young. So start introducing and um, connecting people to different things that can help them learn data um, as early as possible. Um, and also just, uh, again, I've said it so many times, leverage the existing infrastructure. Um, the HBCU uh, uh, connection, uh, Historically Black Colleges and Universities uh, Consortium. Um, again, you have six different um, universities that already had these data science programs um, and initiatives that are moving. And then also that was mentioned, there are 2,333 2, different uh, bills and different things being passed. So there's educational opportunities, there's things for free online, there are grants and different things there. So it's just the major way is just buckle down, do your homework and lean in. And a lot of these bills and a lot of these, you know, governmental initiatives are really on the local level. So this is a really good reason to actually stay involved yeah. and vote uh, and, and, and not just on the national level, but on the local level, because that's actually where you can get the most stuff done, thinking about your local mm -hmm. community. Um, Nikisha, any other organizations that you want to shout out? Yeah, Roger, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Roger. Yeah, I, I want to add to that too. Um, not, not necessarily in terms of organization, but in the mindset of doing a data science career. Um, based on what Sean said, a lot of times, you know, like I work with younger people to get them involved in STEM, and I know Nikisha does that work as well. But a lot of times when we talk about these subjects, we're thinking, you know, 10 years down the line, you know, we'll have this crop of, of black data scientists that we've nurtured from, you know, elementary school on up. Um, and that's that's it doesn't have to be that way. Like it, with Afroblox in particular, we have a lot of freelancers who were professional graphic designers or UI uh, UI experts or you know digital marketers who actually took those data cam courses and now they can consider themselves data scientists. Like it's it's not something where you have to do you know years and years of school. Like those resources are there. Whether you know you're you're waiting tables today. Um, you know, if you have a few hours to commit to learning something, it's that it's just that simple. Like you just learn it. You know, it may take you 70 hours, 100 hours or whatever. But once you're done, you have a skill set that you can use and you can monetize. You can go out and, and, and build something or, or research something or, or get hired at, at one of these these big tech companies. So we don't get run over by the self-driving cars. Um, <laughs> yeah. That, you know, that, I mean, it's, 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 it's a black from crying. But, you know, yeah, but it's. it's uh, yeah, and I just want to yeah, yeah, and I just want to say that if if anyone here is volunteers or works for a nonprofit organization whose goal is specifically to increase data literacy uh, in Black and Brown communities or disadvantaged communities, differently abled people, what have you, um, you can reach out to us. You can reach out to me directly uh, at uh, donate at datacamp.com or go to our website datacamp.com/slash/donates. We have a special program set up uh, similar to Data Camp for Classrooms, but it's set up for nonprofit organizations with a lot more uh, support and uh, a full year of access for you and your members as opposed to six months. Um, so thank you for that. Um, let's move on now to um, creating. So yeah, how, 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 what are some other ways that we can create more educational opportunities for black people? And, and specifically, how do we make coding seem relevant to young black people? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take that one. I think so at the STEM Education Institute, one of our, our mantra is transforming lives by the renewing of minds. And it's just about making things more accessible to students. So we use the case study method to teach coding to students so it becomes not an ambiguous sort of thing, ambiguous things um, for the students. So for example, we did a case study with Bureau Veritas, our executive sponsor, that had a problem where the students had to use coding to solve problems. And I think that as we as educators think about teaching the next generation coding and about tech, we need to make it relevant, right? It can't be in a black box. You know, building a robot is great, but what is the robot gonna do for you? Right. You're more it's, it's more efficient to have a student build like you can easily repl replicate ring. You know, when you press the someone comes to your door, and you can press that. You can build that. That's 
practical that a student can use and making it less inaccessible where it's so highbrow, but more practical. And it also helps you save time. Like if I were to tell you, if your boss comes to you and gives you 50 Excel spreadsheets and it's like, oh, consolidate this data and do this spreadsheet, you're like, great. You open Python, you write one code and you go home early and you can hang out with your kids and have your best life, right? And then lastly, I would say when you're thinking about just wealth management and investing, most people are unaware that there's free code, like the, the universe of coding. If you don't know about GitHub, make sure you go to GitHub. There is every code that you want probably already written. The universe of coders, it's open, right? And so what does that mean? If, you're, if you want to invest in certain type of stock, you can literally code code a program to pick those stocks for you while you're out swimming or you know, having a great vacation, driving a car, not getting hit by it or doing something else. And so it's really about making it very tangible and practical. And those are some of the things that we impart in our students at SEI as well. So just making it really super practical. Amazing. Sean, I know obviously kids play video games, but you actually blew my mind when you told me just just how many young uh, black people are playing video games um, and, you know, how that is just such a natural transition into into coding and programming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, um, oh, no, that, that was it. Um, Roger, I have another question that just came in live from Zala um, that I think you would be really well equipped to answer as a venture capitalist yourself. Um, what can we do to have more black and diverse women in the boardroom, given all the complexity in tech and historical barriers existing for these groups? So again, um, you know, I'll echo back to what I said earlier. I think that burden doesn't necessarily fall on the, the, the black people or the diverse people who are trying to get these roles. I think it really falls on these leaders who are already there, um, mm -hmm. who, are, who are grooming the next level of leadership. Um, I think you know that that is is a question for for those for those leaders. Honestly, like, what are you going to do to bring more people in? Like, if if I'm qualified, there's nothing more I can do but be qualified and go get experience, right? Like, I can't, you know, I'm I, there's no no thing that I could do that could really make you uh, change your mind until you're ready to do that. Um, another thing I'll add though is, I, I, you know, I'm a big proponent of entrepreneurship. I think you know, if we have these ideas and you know we can't find, we can't you know, get into these rooms with these other people, build it ourselves, like just build it, you know, and it's not as easy. <laughs> I know it's not as easy as, as just doing it. And it's really hard. I'm a startup founder. And trust me, it is it is very, very difficult. Um, but, you know, if you're successful, you know, you, now you don't have to, you know, be promoted to the boardroom. You know, you are in the boardroom <laughs> because you've built it from the ground up. Um, so I think, you know, we have to create that that future that we want to see. Um, and then the, the people in leadership now, they really have to look internally and, re and, and really confront their biases and really, you know, try to become better people um, and, 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 you know, bring on more diverse boards and, and get out of their echo chamber and their silos where they, you know, they only, you know, hire friends or friends of friends or kids of friends and things like that, or their, their college buddy, or, you know, all those things really matter. Um, being able to look outside and, um, you know, hire people based on, based on, you know, their, their skill and their potential, more so than their social standing or their social status. Right. And obviously those opportunities are going to come from the top, top down if boardrooms are already looking and getting creative and looking at their current pool of talent and promoting inside and giving people a shot. But it, it, it can also start from, from the, um, the bottom level as well. Uh, and uh, we, need to, we need to highlight successful people such as yourselves in the Black community who are creating these opportunities to show that, yes, it is possible, um, and 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 we can and we can, we can uh, make a difference. Um, and I would just add to that, yeah. just for those who are trying to wondering, well, where do we find these people to put on the mm -hmm. board? I think there's some practical things. Call call universities and say, hey, who are your alumni who uh, are part of the Black community that you think that we should work with? I'm sure, you know, alumni aren't that hard to find. There's some really easy ways. You can use facial recognition on LinkedIn to find people of color who um, can be on your board. So this is not a difficult task to do. 
if you can't figure that out, you can always drop me an email and I'll help you. <laughs> I think everybody <laughs> here is open access. And so I think just having some practical, tangible ways to find these things and find these individuals. I mean, half of the time people retweet things on my feed of people that I've never even heard of mm. who are from the black community. And I'm like, oh, wow, I never knew this person and I'll follow them. And so again, there should not be an excuse of where to find these people to put on, put on boards. Absolutely. Um, it's, um, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, moving on, uh, we're, we're almost at time here. Um, any other final thoughts as to how we can create more, uh, in, in, in terms of how we can make data science more uh, prevalent within the back, black community and how you, your final words and how you would encourage people who may not have ever even heard of data science before to, to get into this space? I can, I I can jump in. Sean, <laughs> we'll do Sean first, then Roger, then Nikisha. Got it. Okay, if I if I had a final words about how to jump in, I would just say again, I have to double down on community and I have to just double down on the leaning in part. So aggressive for good. Um, we have a community of about 104,000 people who are just looking for a job in technology, but they're not just looking, they're going forward and actually saying like, all right, everybody in our schools, uh, everybody in my community, how can we learn together? Who knows this? Let's uh, learn this thing together. And then the next step that they take is they actually start doing collaborative projects where like, all right, if I build this thing with members of my community, even if it doesn't become a, a, a huge thriving company, maybe it's a smaller company that helps me cover a couple of bills. Maybe it's just something that I add on to my portfolio. So, so when I go for these job interviews and they say, what have you worked on or what have you done? You don't have any official experience. You can just step up and say, all right, I have done this. I was the winner of this hackathon. Um, all these different things that you can really uh, build upon and, and just connect people with when it comes to people who are looking for experience. Um, I think that's one of the major things. The other one is you have to realize that there are reports of about $30 billion being lost by a lack of technical talent. The jobs are there, um, the opportunities there. It's to the point where now I almost think it's even, it's, it's the, the need for talent may overpower racism at this point. Not to say that <laughs> yes. that's what all the leading causes are, but at this point, if, you're, if, you, if these companies are in a place where if I can get a, a solid data scientist, this is gonna help me make millions of dollars in the long run. I need this person, are you that person? So again, um, I know Rogers doesn't want to put the onus so much on the corporations, but I'm going to bring it back on the person to say, again, lean in, do your homework, join a community and start building your portfolio. Again, yeah. data, uh, data camp is an amazing place where you can start, uh, you know, learning the skills you would need to build those things out. Thank you. And even if you don't have access to a teacher for data camp for classrooms or data camp donates, you know, anyone can make a free account on data camp, take the first chapter of any course. And there are actually plenty of our for everyone theory courses that are completely for free. And I also just want to take this opportunity, like think about internships and companies. One of the mm -hmm. things I'm most proud about data camp is that mm -hmm. we pay all of our interns a living wage because work is work. And this is how you can actually get a diverse pool of interns, people that you wouldn't normally hire. Because let's face it, the type of people out of college, that can afford to take an unpaid internship are going to be people that are come from a wealthier background. And at the end of the day, if you want your companies to succeed, you're going to want to sell to everyone. Okay. Not just people yeah. who have money or anyone's mostly we want to sell to everyone. So if you want a diverse customer base, you're going to need a diverse employee base as well. Um, to Roger and then Nikisha, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. I, you know, just to echo Sean's, uh, sense to me, I think he said, uh, 30 million jobs today. And, uh, I think they're they're you know the the experts are saying up to 85 million jobs over the next you know few years will go unfilled across the globe. Um, so I think one of the ways you know to really get people involved or, or get more people excited about it is to really point to the amount of money that can be made, the amount of opportunity that's going that's you know being cre created, the demand is going up for these roles. Um, you know, just like you know you you have a, a smart black kid or, or or a family who you know has a smart black kid or, or whatever, and they're pushing them to the medical field or the legal field. And, you know, these are the traditional roles that you, you know, you push smart people to. I think we need to push data, data science into that as well. Um, Cause not only is there going to be a lot of opportunity over the next 10 years, like Sean said, it might even, you know, annihilate racism, the amount, what, what can really, 
kill racism, money, right? Like that's what it that's what it boils down to. I wanted to say it. It's the way of the money. So if I gotta go find the talent, you know, and 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 the ta- only talent I could hire is is this black talent, you know, then I'm gonna do that regardless of what I think about whoever. So it's really up to um it's really up to the people, like Sean said, to to go out there and and learn these things and 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 be in a position to take advantage of it um, when the time comes because it's it's coming. Like it's there's no way you can really get away from it. Yeah, it, I love that it's coming. It's here. It's it's all the train has left the station. I love that. I mean, one of the ways, obviously, partner with SEI. We we do this work. We work with local boys and girls club to train up high school students to do this work. And what I think is so fascinating about what's happening, what we saw with COVID-19 is a lot of people were displaced by their their current jobs and they were sent home. And how many people that were did not know how to get on Zoom or did not know how to manage different things. And so it was like a light shined on to the lack of technical skills. And so at, for employers, if you if you're you probably employers probably learned a lot about the fact that their employees had zero technological skills. Hmm. And so taking advantage of something of data camp and programs that train people up. Again, we're not saying all your employees have to be in the in the back coding. We're not saying that, but you have to be technologically aware. We've seen studies are showing us that that firms are either hiring people that are really good at coding and then people who are really good at the business. But what they need is people who can do both. Because guess what? If you don't understand the code, you can't really build a thriving revenue generating business. And you see this with all the hacking with security and all the cyber wars that are happening. If you don't have someone in your management team that understands this stuff, you're going to fall victim to this. And then lastly, I would say, just just, sh- just showing the sign of the times, I. I was looking at one of these bills in Congress and it was talking about quantum computing. And I just had to laugh because I said, okay, so if we can't even, if people don't even know what Python and R is, and we're trying to get them to quantum computing, that is like the farthest reach I've ever heard of. And so if if we don't invest in this now as a country, as a, gosh, as a humanity, we're going to fall far behind of what the demands are and what we need. And so with that, I just want to say thank you to Nathaniel and Data Camp for, and my fellow panelists for ha- having this great conversation. I can go on for and on, but I'll stop there. Nikisha, thank you so much for your thoughtful comments. Sean, Roger, this has been so illuminating and I hope inspiring for our, our members of our audience. Before we go, I just want to quickly give each of you an opportunity to tell people where they can find you on the social meds. Nikisha, where are you at? Yeah, so we're www.steameducationalinstitute.org. You can find us at on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and happy if you have any questions, just email me info at stemeducationalinstitute.com. So thank you so much. Great. Sean. Thank you. Thank you. So you can find us at uh, our website is uh, ingressive.org. Uh, so I guess you can see the, how, the, how the company is spelled. Most of our social media platforms, again, is ingressive for good. So that is Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and again, thank you so much for uh, having us on. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And Roger. Um, Afroblocks, afroblocks.com. Um, again, you can see the spelling at the bottom. All of our social medias are that same handle at Afroblocks on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Visit our page. We have a lot of resources available for people who are looking to break into this space. So, you know, there's a lot of blogs and, and a lot of details there. Yeah, check us out um, if you're looking for freelancers as well. Um, check us out because we have a lot of talented people on the platform. And again, thank you, uh, Nathaniel. Thank you, Nikisha and Sean. Um, this has been great. This has been fun. I, I can talk about this stuff all day. So, <laughs> yeah, we'll have to we'll have to do it again, and hopefully before the next Black History Month. I think um, yep, yep. this has been awesome. this has been fantastic. Um, you can learn all about Data Camp social impact initiatives at datacamp.com slash donates. Um, you uh, Data Camp donates applications have just opened up. So if you're a nonprofit organization, please apply, uh, and you can uh, reach out to me directly at uh, 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 donate at datacamp.com or follow us all over social media at Data Camp. Uh, happy Black History Month, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Bye bye. <laughs>